at least give the gentleman a uh, background in terms of concerns from both a human rights standpoint and a legal process standpoint to have someone involved in human rights, uh, human trafficking issues, and also from the aspect of, of being a lawyer working in these areas uh, as, as the, uh, the director of um, the machine human trafficking, working with the human trafficking clinic in Ann Arbor. But just the broad issues that he's worked on a, a variety of these things, I think it's a nice follow in terms of kind of if, if we're going to do what Andy said and we're going to stick something in the spoke of the wheel, these are the kinds of conversations as well as international conversations. So please join me in welcome to Johnny Henry. Work. I've worked with 
um, you know, several victims of human trafficking. And the reason why I'm here today to talk about labor trafficking in particular is because, in my experience, especially here in Michigan, uh, the majority of victims that I've worked with have been victims of labor trafficking and not sex trafficking. Um, and actually, a somewhat big majority of the, of the clients that I've worked with have been victims of labor trafficking. So what we're going to do today is basically talk about um, what labor trafficking is, you know, what it looks like, how it happens, um, what are the motivations for the people that are doing these things, and what we can possibly do to prevent it from happening in the future. Um, so I'll have a few different parts to this talk. The first part, since I am a lawyer, and I work you know, within the legal context every day, is going to be a brief explanation of the law of human trafficking, um, and what human trafficking is defined as in the statutes that you know, we have to apply every day in my work. All right, so um, you know, what is labor trafficking legally? And by legally, I mean you know, legally speaking, what's the legal definition of human trafficking? So we do have a law called the Trafficking Victim Protection Act, which was passed in 2000, which gives us a definition of human trafficking. Um, and labor trafficking and sex trafficking both you know, fall under that definition of human trafficking. So I like to say that the definition basically has three parts. The first part I like to call it is the what, right? The actions. What is actually being done? So we see here the actions that um, can constitute human trafficking: a recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining any persons for services. Right. So we see that it's not necessarily just transport. I think a lot of people get caught up in human trafficking, and they it kind of connotes trafficking, like drug trafficking, like people taking individuals from one country and bring them to another country in order to force them to do things, right? And that's not necessarily always the case. And that doesn't have to be the case according to law. So you can see it could be the recruitment. If you just recruit someone who ends up being trafficked, you know, if you recruit them for that trafficking, that can constitute human trafficking. Um, and again, provision and obtaining, right? If you just, you know, provide someone to someone else who is going to traffic that person, that is also, you know, considered human trafficking, if it, if it fits the rest of the definition, which will go over. So I want you to first you know, understand that human trafficking is not just necessarily taking people from one place and bringing them to another place. It's a much wider scope of actions that can be human trafficking. Uh, the second part of the definition I like to call uh, the how, right? So the first was the what, what do they do? The second is the how, right? How do they do those things? So they do those things through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. Right. So these are all fairly simple definitions, right? Force just take someone by the arm and say, you have to pick these crops, or you have to sow this garden, right? Physical force. Fraud is taking someone and you know, tricking them into doing the work that they don't necessarily want to do, right? Telling them they're going to get paid, or telling them they're going to get to go to college, and making promises that are not necessarily following through those promises. That's defrauding someone to make them do work they don't want to do. The last one is coercion. Um, coercion is, you know, threatening. And we'll go over coercion a lot in a few minutes because coercion is really the one that pops up a lot with regard to labor trafficking. So we have the what, what happens. We have the how, how it happens, and then we have the why. You know, for what purposes are people doing this, right? And so the why is for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, penage, debt bondage, or slavery. Right, so that's our basic framework, right? We have certain actions that people are doing, the what, how they're doing them, and for what purposes, right? So the, the what, the how, and the why. And so we'll break these down a little bit more um, in detail right now. So the actions, what we call in the law the actus reus, which is really just a fancy Latin word for actions, right? Just every crime has to have some action involved, like robbery. Robbery involves the physical taking of someone's belongings and removing them, right? Human trafficking, again, same thing. It requires an action. We just went through those. Right? The recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtain. Right? So remember, it's kind of a broad scope of action that can constitute human trafficking. It doesn't just have to be transportation. Then we have the means or the how, right? So through the use of force, fraud, or coercion. And I start coercion because coercion is the one that I see most often in the labor trafficking context, especially here in Michigan. Um, and the nice thing is the T 
GPTA for Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which was passed in 2000, also gives us a definition of what coercion is in the context of human trafficking. So we can take a look at that. Coercion is basically broken down into three parts. Right? The first part is threats of serious harm or physical restraint. So if you threaten that you're going to hurt someone unless they do work, or if you threaten that you're going to lock somebody up unless they do work, that is coercion with regard to human trafficking. Uh, the other thing that it can be is a scheme or plan that basically intends to do that same thing, right? So if you create this scheme, create a plan that's basically going to intimidate someone into doing work because they think they're going to get harmed or they think they're going to get imprisoned, then that is also coercion for the sake of human trafficking. And then the third thing that it can be, which is really important in the labor context, is threatened abuse of the legal system. I see this all the time. It's almost ubiquitous with the clients that I work with. Um, and threatened abuse of the legal process usually takes the form of threatening the person that they're going to get deported unless they do what you want them to do. Right? So these people are here most of the time illegally. Um, they don't know anyone here. They don't have any threat. They don't know how the legal system works. And the people that are doing the trafficking will basically say, you have to do this or else I'm going to call immigration. They're going to throw you in jail and deport you or worse. Right? So, these are the kind of three forms that coercion can take. And again, when I work with clients, I have to, to prove that they are victims of trafficking, right? So I have to prove that these things happen. And for the most part, it usually comes down to coercion being the third, the third option and threatened abuse of the legal process. You see it all the time. All right, so then moving on to, again, that, that third part of the definition, the ends, right? involuntary servitude. This one is fairly self-explanatory, right? Making someone work when they don't want to work, right? Then we have peonage, which can be either a form of debt bondage um, or you know, paying a penalty for being a criminal. Um, if someone says, you know, you cross my family member, therefore I'm going to make you work and do this, um, and they force someone to work or do things they don't want to do, that can be considered peonage. Uh, then we have debt bondage. I put a star next to that one because, again, this one happens a lot in the labor trafficking context. Um, debt bondage is where someone basically takes control over another human being by making them believe that they have to pay debts, and that they have to pay debts or else, right? And so then the people will work to pay off those debts, when a lot of times the debts aren't even real, or the person doesn't have to necessarily do that work to pay off those debts. But these things happen a lot, and I'll give you some examples later on to show you how people kind of get reeled into this debt bondage and don't necessarily know what's going to happen, and then it happens, and they don't really have any options except for to work when they don't actually want to. Um, that one happens a lot, and we'll go over it some more. Um, or slavery, and we all know uh, what slavery is, you know, the owning of another human being, like property, that's also a forbidden end, right? So, I really hope just by this, this brief kind of introduction that you guys have a decent understanding of what the law of human trafficking is, right? And how labor trafficking falls into that framework. So we have the what, um, which is transportation, harboring, um, providing or obtaining a person, and the how through forced fraud or coercion, and the for why, right? The, the what purposes, involuntary servitude, penis, debt bondage, or labor, right? So there's a lot of parts to that definition. Right? And there's a, a lot of things that force, fraud, and coercion can mean, right? So, so I want you to really start to understand that human trafficking, especially labor trafficking, can take forms that aren't necessarily your archetype that you would imagine slavery being, right? It can take many different forms, and it can look like a lot of different things. Um, so you really have to keep an open mind and keep an open eye to see how trafficking can actually happen in the labor context in the modern day. So I want to give you a little background about how the TVPA, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, actually came to be. Okay, so um, in 1995, there was the famous El Monte sweatshop case. And some of you may have heard of this or know something about it. Um, this was a, a really extreme case of labor trafficking. Uh, it was El Monte, which is kind of a suburb of LA. And what happened is the police ended up finding 72 Thai women um, all confined in a small apartment complex. 
Uh, and the, the apartment complex was actually used as a sweatshop as well. And I think there was uh, approximately eight units in the apartment, so there's 72 women and eight units. And some of them, some of those units were used as actually a sweatshop facility. So the bedrooms, they were packed in like eight per bed. Uh, and from what was, what was told to the scene, supposedly the apartment complex looked fairly normal from the outside. This isn't the actual one, but supposedly it looked fairly normal from the outside. Uh, but once the police were actually able to get inside, they realized that on the inside of the fences and on the inside of the walls, there was barbed wire. Uh, a lot of the windows were barred up um, and shut, shut with uh, plywood and things like that. So it didn't look too bad from the outside, but when you got on the inside, you see that it was basically a prison uh, and that they couldn't get out even if they tried. Uh, the traffickers didn't let them leave the facility at all. Um, they would actually go get food for the women at the store, bring it back for the women to actually buy at really inflated prices. There's another kind of system of debt bondage, right? They would bring the food to them, cheap food, and charge them exorbitant prices and say that you owe us for that food type of thing. Um, they, I think they paid the women about 69 cents per hour, so there was no way they were ever going to get out of the debt that they believed that they were in. Um, so this is a really high profile case. This is what kind of set off the chain of reactions, which actually ended up um, ending up in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act being passed into law in 2000. Um, so I wanted to give you kind of a background of how that happened, but I also wanted to give you an example of what labor trafficking can be. This is really severe, and this is not necessarily how labor trafficking looks today. Um, this was 20 years ago. There was a pretty famous case, and probably a lot of traffickers know about this. Um, you know, they're not going to necessarily make the same mistakes that these traffickers. Right? Um, this was really bad, really kind of flagrant and brutal. Um, but labor trafficking today doesn't necessarily look like this. It's not going to be people cramped in an apartment building and literally in prison. Right? So I want you to kind of forget that notion. Right? Labor trafficking today could be a myriad of things and most likely not going to be this. Right? So this is what gave us the law. But labor trafficking has changed a lot in the last 19, 20 years. All right, so what does labor trafficking look like, right? And in the modern day, um, given that it's been 20 years since El Monte and we've had laws on it, you know, what does labor trafficking look like today? Does it look like a chain game out there where people are chained together in a kind of classic version of being in prison, being enslaved? Or does it look like that? Does it look like a, a couple of dudes out in the farm picking peppers, right? And a lot of you might look at the picture on the right and say that looks like a very normal picture, especially in Michigan. They have a lot of agriculture. That happens all the time. But the reason why I'm here today is to tell you that that could possibly be a trafficking situation. You know, if you look a little bit deeper, just people out working on a farm could be being trafficked. And we would never know just by just by glancing at them as we pass down the street. So again, the theme of this talk will be, you know, opening your eyes to what labor trafficking can be and what it might look like in today's day and age. Um, so, yeah, it's a new age type of slavery, basically, right? Traffickers, they're not the dumbest people in the world. They're not the smartest people in the world, usually, but they're not the dumbest people in the world either. And they can, they can adopt new methods, they can adapt, and they can learn how to hide, right? And they learn how to enslave people, basically, without the outward signs of enslavement, right? So it's, they find ways to hide, and we need to find those ways that they hide so that we know what's going on. Um, again, it's not going to be obvious on the outside, like those pictures I put up, right? It's not going to be people that are changing, going through the roads of some farm. It's going to be people that look like you or I. It's going to be people that you know, look like the trafficked herds, right? It's, a lot of times it's hard to tell the difference between a trafficked herd and someone that's being trafficked. So, you know, again, we have to change our, our outlook. It's not necessarily going to be obvious. Um, and this is really important. You know, it's mental and emotional restraints, mental and emotional barriers that keep these people in prison. It's not necessarily physical there. Sometimes it is, like in the El Monte case, it really was a fence and barbed wire. But for the most part, it's going to be mental, emotional restraints that people can't shake. And that's why they're forced to go to work. You know, they think, if I don't do this, if I, if I leave and don't 
do my you know, farm work that I'm supposed to do, um, I'm gonna go to prison. Uh, these people are gonna hurt me, or they're gonna hurt my family back home, right? So it's not that they can't physically leave, it's that they think they can't leave, right? So I just want you to think about it for a second, and I'm gonna tell you a few stories you know, in a few minutes, but before we do that, I just really want you to take a second and think about you know, what if this were you, right? What if you were in a situation like this? What would you think and what would you do, right? Picture going to a country where you don't know the language, you don't have any friends, any family, you don't know a single soul out there, really, except for maybe the people that are attached to you. And you think a lot hates you because you've been fed this story over and over and over that if you run away, you're in a legal immigrant and you're going to get thrown in jail, and America hates legal immigrants. Um, and you just have no idea what to do, right? You have threats constantly that either you're going to get hurt, your family back home is going to get hurt, you're going to get thrown in jail, and you really don't know what's going to happen if you decide to run away from it, if you decide to quit doing the work that you're being forced to do. And so I just want you to really put yourself in that situation. You know, ask yourself, if I didn't know the language and I didn't know a single soul, and I thought bad things were going to happen, you know, would you have the courage to actually run away? Or would you keep working and doing the things that we're being asked to do to protect yourself or protect your family? Right? So it's an incredibly difficult situation. It's not physical barriers, it's these mental barriers. It's the thought of something bad happening that really keeps these people in slavery. So, again, a lot of people might still be thinking out there, um, okay, I understand what food trafficking is, I understand what labor trafficking can possibly look like in today's day and age, but does it happen in Michigan? Does it happen right here in our own backyard? Right? This is, once again, pure Michigan, right? There's nothing more beautiful than those commercials and that voice, right? This is the most idyllic place in the world. And we have beautiful piers and sunsets. It's actually close to where I live, the Grand Haven Pier. Um, you know, it's a perfect place to go picking apples in the fall and drink cider and donuts. And, you know, it's, it's a wonderful place to be. There's no way trafficking could actually happen in our backyard, in, in pure Michigan. Right. Well, I'm here to tell you that, unfortunately, it does. Um, and it's happening today somewhere else. Just about guaranteed. Right. So, in order to really illuminate the stuff I've been talking about thus far, I'd like to tell you two stories. Um, these are two stories that are typical of the clients that I've served um, in my time at the Human Capital Clinic, in my time at Migrant Legal Aid in Grand Rapids. Um, they're not the actual the actual people's names. Um, it's not their actual, you know, perfect story because they can't do that for client confidentiality reasons. But these are stories that kind of are typical in human trafficking cases that I've come across initially. So the first one, let's call him Juan. He was a young man from Mexico, right? So Juan wanted to come to the United States to make more money for his family back in Mexico, right? So he comes up illegally and starts working in Florida. There's a decent amount of work in Florida, but there's a lot of workers in Florida, right? So he's not getting all that much work and not really able to send all that much money back home to his family. So Juan walks into a, a Latin grocery store one day down in Florida and sees a posting for work in Michigan. He has no idea what Michigan is, but he sees the posting that says $10 an hour, possible overtime. Right? He's thinking, if I go make $10 an hour and work some overtime, I can send a whole bunch of money back home to my family. So I'm going to sign up. You know, sign me up immediately. I don't care where Michigan is, I'll go. Right? So he ends up actually having an interview right, for the job up in Michigan. Has an interview with two older Mexican women. Right? Juan's Mexican, two older women giving the interview. He doesn't think anything of it. Right? At the interview, they ask a lot of questions. They ask him you know, if he knows English. Uh, can he read and write? Uh, does he have any family in the United States? Does he have any friends in the United States? Does he have any family or friends uh, in Michigan? Right? Uh, you know, does he know of anyone in Michigan? You know, kind of weird questions that Juan doesn't necessarily know what they have to do with you know, picking apples in Michigan, but he's going to answer them because he wants the job, right? But Juan figures, he said no to a lot of those questions, so he thinks he doesn't have a job. Right? So he goes away from the interview, kind of dejected. A few days later, turns out that he's got the job of mission, right? 
And it turns out that three other guys that were down here in Florida also got jobs in fishing with these same, same ladies, right? So the ladies tell them all, they take them out to dinner, they go out and buy them drinks, and they all have a good time, because they're going to Michigan, they're going to make a bunch of money, and be able to send money back home, right? It's all, all good things, right? So the next day, they get the van that the, the women have procured, and they start driving up to Michigan, right? It's a long haul from Florida all the way up to Michigan. And somewhere along the line, on that drive up to Michigan, the tone of the relationship kind of starts to change. So the women will stop at a gas station and say, you guys pay for gas. And Juan thinks, okay, that's fine. I mean, I'm going to get a job in Michigan and make good money. I'll, I can pay for some gas on the way up there. I didn't know I was going to have to do it, but I'll do it, right? Uh, so they keep going, drive a little bit further. They stop at a grocery store to get food. And the women demand that these four men that were chosen for the jobs pay for the food. And again, it's a little unexpected. They didn't necessarily know that they were going to be paying for all the food on the way up there, but you know, they'll do it. They're going to get some good jobs, and you know, hopefully they'll pay it back tenfold to their families back home. So they go a little bit further, and then they stop again. More gas, more food. And some of the guys actually run out of money. And the women start demanding that they call their family back home and have their family wire money, or else they're not going to take it the rest of the way to Michigan. So all of a sudden, there's you know, some demands are coming out of left field, basically, that they had no idea were going to happen. So it turns out they end up you know, making it up to Michigan. And they get here, and the women have a trailer um, rented from a farmer out in the middle of nowhere. And they just have a trailer rented by themselves, and there's no job. There's no $10 an hour possible overtime um, that they thought they were going to get. There's nothing. Right? Turns out that the two women have two adult sons who look kind of like enforcers, who are in the trailer with them, right? And so it turns out it's a two-bedroom trailer. Imagine, you know, I'm sure we've all kind of seen them or been in them, and, you know, trailers aren't that big. Two bedrooms, one bedroom on one side, kind of like the kitchen and the family room in the middle, and another bedroom on the other side. And so the two adult sons have their room on one side, the two older women have the room on the other side, and then the four guys are forced to, you know, fight for room in the kitchen slash dressing room in the middle. So, again, there's no job. The women have taken their passports or any documentation for purposes of procuring a job. Right? So they say, we're going to get you a job, and we need your passports, we need all your documentation. Give it to us, and we'll get you a job. So if they don't know where they are, they're in the middle of nowhere in Michigan, and want a job, so they're going to give up their passports. So the women then take them on buses, not buses, on them, their vans they have from farm to farm to try to find jobs. Right? Turns out after a little while of searching, they find a job at a certain farm. And next thing they know, the two sons also have a job on the same farm. Right? So the two sons are there to be the eyes and ears of, of the two older ladies on the farm while these four guys are working. So they're still happy to have a job. Right? So they have a job, hopefully they can start making money and send some money back home. Right? So again, remember, they're in the middle of Michigan, they don't have their own transportation. Uh, they have basically no money at this point, and you know they don't know anything. So they're working, working. They work for two weeks, say, and get their paycheck. All of a sudden, on payday, the two enforcers and the two older ladies come with them to work and actually watch them get their checks, and then take them in the van to a check cashing store, have them cash their check, and then take all the money. And why do they take the money? Why? Why do these four guys let them take the money? You think they're just like handing over the money like they want to hand them? No, they have no documentation. They've been told that they owe however much for the trip up to Michigan, right? Transportation's not free. So they owe however much for that. They're being charged 500 bucks a month each for rent in the family room of the trailer. So they have to pay that off. And they just they just rack up the debts. And they think, you know, this is the way it works. And hopefully they can you know, make some money and get out of this debt. But for now, they're going to try to pay it off. Right? Because they don't know anything else to do. They have nowhere else to go. Right? So you see how that situation kind of starts off friendly, starts off exciting, right? a new adventure in Michigan. Right? And then slowly, gradually turns to you're in a place where you don't know, you're with people you don't necessarily know that well, and you have nowhere else to go. Right? 
And so again, you know, the women and the enforcers threatened, you guys are illegal. If you try to leave me, we're gonna call immigration, you're gonna get deported, go to jail, or worse, right? So you can't do that. Um, luckily, you know, they, these four men are actually able to get out of the situation, but after they got out, they actually finally realized that those questions that she asked were all for a reason, right? All four of these guys had the same characteristics. <coughs> they didn't know English, they were basically illiterate, they didn't know anyone in Michigan, they didn't have any family in the United States, so basically they had no resources, no ability to be able to get out of a situation like they were in. Um, and the reason they asked those questions was to pick those kind of people. So that's one way you could possibly have it. And another quick story, um, very different person, from a very different place, but I want you to try to pick out the similarities um, in these two stories and how things might happen. So let's call her Beatrice. Um, she was a young woman from Togo. And when she was about 10 or 11 years old, living in Togo, uh, her uncle came to her family and said, I have a visa and I can take Beatrice with me to the United States and she can go to school, she can go to college, she can end up having a great career and you know, possibly spend a lot of money back to Togo for you guys. And Beatrice is 10 or 11. She's heard stories about America and she's all in. Her parents think you know, it's a great opportunity for you know, one of our children to get an education in the United States, like this, this is awesome, right? So they agree, and again, it's the uncle of, of Beatrice, right? So it's someone that's their family they can trust. And so Beatrice goes off to live with the uncle for a few weeks before they, before they fly to the United States. And so in those few weeks, Beatrice, again, is 10, 11 years old. Um, she's told by her uncle that in order to go to the United States, she'll have to pretend that she's someone else. She'll have to pretend that she um, is actually the uncle's daughter. So that when they go through customs and things like that, she can get through on this visa that actually isn't hers. Right? So if she's 10 or 11 years old, she's trusting her uncle, not a big deal, she can pretend to be someone else for a few days while they go through customs and you know, get to the United States. She doesn't think anything of it. That's kind of a fun little adventure. So the uncle kind of trains her how to say her new name, and who she is, and her little bit of background, and next thing you know, they come to the United States. So they come to the United States, and again, once the trip kind of occurs, the situation, the dynamic, changes a little bit, right? So she gets here and realizes that she's not going to be attending school, right? Like she was promised. She was promised she's going to get a great education. Now that's not happening. Now she's working in a hair braiding salon uh, with a bunch of other young women from Togo. She's just kind of helping clean up, do whatever she can, but she's working kind of long hours. And she's staying in a little apartment with several other women from Togo. And these are all women that basically just got picked up and taken from Togo to the United States, and most of them don't know English and only know how to braid hair and kind of help out around the hair break salon, do whatever they can. And again, they're they're transported to and from work and where they live by the traffickers, right? By the uncle. Uh, and they don't have any access to the outside world. So you see how it's two very different situations, but with a lot of similarities that go on, right? So a lot of times, uh oh, so I was talking to Sean. Right, for labor. So usually it's someone that the person knows and they usually look 
fairly similar, at least in the labor context and, and the stuff that I've seen here in Michigan. Um, again, often the same nationality. And it's always those verbal and emotional threats, the verbal emotional abuse that keeps these people locked up. Right? And I didn't necessarily go into all that much detail with those two stories, but in all the Jackson cases I've seen, um, almost far enough, uh, it's the threats of possible legal ramifications and the threats of physical harm, and especially the threats of possible harm to the person's family back home. Because, um, like I said, it's usually someone the person knows, and usually someone the person's family knows, and that person knows who your family is back in Togo, or back in Honduras, or wherever you came from, and it threatens that you'll have them harm, right? Or she'll have them harm, whoever it may be, right? So it's, it's almost always those emotional and mental barriers and not physical that keeps these people locked up. And so that's why it's so much more difficult to see these things. Um, because it's not chains, it's not locked in keys. It's, it's just inside the person's mind why they can't be, uh, why they can't get out of the situation. And the last thing is documentation is really a key in a lot of these stories. So a lot of times people will come over, sometimes they'll come over legally on H2 visas, worker visas, things like that. Um, but what happens the majority of the time is they think they need to give these things up in order to find employment or this, that, and the other thing, or they're just forced to give them up, right? And so once they give up their documentation, they really feel like they have no opportunity to leave it because they're, they're basically no one of them. They have no documentation of who they actually are. They're being fed stories about how the police in the United States are brutal, especially towards immigrants, and how if they leave, the police are going to treat them worse than chapter. So, you know, they don't necessarily want to do that. They're going to try to stick that. So, you know, it's these themes that kind of come up more and more and more, uh, as, as we see Chapsky cases uh, in Michigan. And so these are the things, they're not easy to see. So it's, when we look a little bit closer, these are the things we need to look for. Um, because if we don't see them, then we're probably going to not notice Chapsky right in front of our face. Um, so last Thing, I'll give you a few more things to kind of look for. Um, but one of the last things that I wanted to talk about today was the victim-centered approach. Um, and so this is uh, an approach that I've just kind of learned in my career and what Bridget Carr really is an advocate of at the University of Michigan with Captain Bank. And what the, the victim-centered approach really means is addressing human trafficking you know, through the lens of protecting and helping the victim. So I've worked with a lot of um, you know, US attorneys and things like that. And it's really unfortunate because a lot of times they don't want to grasp this. They want to get the bad guy, right? They want to put the chapters in jail, and they want to make a big arrest and make a big case and you know, know that they're, they're putting the bad guys in that car. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. We definitely want to do that all the time. You know, someone's trafficking, they deserve to be fine. But the way to get to them, and the way to really protect victims, is to really take a, a victim-centered approach to the, to the whole issue. And by that, in law enforcement, uh, in the way we write our law, uh, we have to be conscious of who these people are, right, and what they're going through, um, and the, the emotional kind of turmoil and strife that they're going through, you know, when we possibly encounter them, right? So, uh, like I said, these people are often, almost always, really, really frightened. So the way that law enforcement interacts with them can make a big difference um, to maybe assuage their fears a little bit, right? They've been fed stories about how the police are bad, right? How are we gonna counteract that, right? But how are we gonna make them believe that police aren't necessarily a bad thing, that they can't help? Um, they don't trust you, right? So they, they just got burned for trusting someone, right? They trusted someone, they come to America and give them a job, and that fell through. And now all of a sudden they're in a horrible situation, so they've learned quickly to, to not necessarily trust them, right? So how are we gonna counteract that lack of trust, right? They, they're not gonna necessarily trust us when we walk them, right? We need to be aware of this so that we can foster those relationships and 
you know, eventually have them open up to us. Um, and police are even more frightening, right? Again, they make bad stories nonstop. So when they encounter a police officer, they're going to be even more frightened, more, you know, they're going to be more willing to close up, to not share what's actually happening because they think that bad things are going to happen. So I have just one more kind of short story um, to evidence um, this, what happens when you don't necessarily take this victim centered approach. Um, so I was fortunate enough a few months ago to go along with Bridget Carr to the FBI headquarters in, in downtown Detroit uh, when uh, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, um, were conducting a statewide raid of massage parlors here in the state of Michigan. And they believed that there was trafficking situations going on in the massage parlors. So the plan was to go in really early in the morning, sweep through all these massage parlors throughout the state, and then bring back the victims to certain spots where the victims could be interviewed, or the potential victims. Right? We didn't know if they were actually victims yet, but they were going to bring them back to certain places, and they could be interviewed to ascertain whether or not they were victims. So the FBI headquarters in Detroit was one of the spots where the victims were to be you know, brought back to. So it was a win in the fact that Bridget and myself were allowed to be there with law enforcement agencies when the, the victims were actually brought back. That was kind of the first, right? Usually they would have victim advocates kind of on the scene when it happened. So that was a, kind of a big step in maybe recognizing a victim-centered approach, right? So we were there to kind of to interview them, but to also advocate on their behalf and try to make sure that you know things were being done in a way that made them feel safe, right? And we tried, but it didn't necessarily work all that well because of the way that this, this raid was, was carried out, right? So it's 4 o'clock in the morning. Your door gets busted down by a SWAT team, basically. And men wearing SWAT uniforms rush in, basically wake up, grab you, take all your belongings away from you, and pile you into a basement, and then drive you down to the FBI. So I don't care who you are. You're going to think you're in trouble. Right? You're going to think I did something really, really, really bad. Right? I don't care if it's these two people that are there when I get there that are kind of nice to me and interview me in a nice way. I'm still going to be frightened. Right? So that's why I'm here trying to advocate a victim centered approach. It needs to infiltrate everything we do. And it's, it's not being, it might not be seen as being tough or gritty on crime and things like that. But we're going to be able to find more traffickers if we are aware of what the victims are going for. Because what happens when we interview those 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 women from from the massage parlors? What do you think happens? Right. Well, after about the sixth person that I interviewed, um, and after the sixth time that I heard she just arrived in the United States ten days ago, I started figuring out that's probably not exactly what's going on in the massage parlors. And we just heard it over and over and over again. And some of them, some of them were okay when we were calm and were telling their stories. Some of them were crying, you know, just distraught. But we're still saying they just got here ten days ago. They just give massages, and that's was their story. Right? They did it for ten days, and don't know anything else. And the reason that happens is because they're just scared out of their wits. You know, they if you get far into four o'clock in the morning taken up by armored trucks and men, you're, you're going to be scared. And you're going to think that you're going to go to jail or you're going to do something bad. And you've been told that there's a story you should tell that's ever happened, right? And so this happened, and now you're going to tell that story. You don't want anything worse to happen to you. So what ended up happening is, you know, there were no arrests made. Um, there was not one of the women actually confessed that something was going on. Um, some of them were really distraught, you know, and looked heartbroken, but none of them said it, right? So it was a great victory for us to actually be there on the scene, but it just didn't work, right? So that's what I'm here to advocate today that, you know, no matter what field you, you go into later on in life, um, no matter what field you influence, remember that if you want to really make a difference, you really have to think about what people are going through. Right? They're frightened, they're scared, and they don't know you. They don't know us. And in order to get them to possibly trust us, we really need to rethink 
the way that we do a lot of this. All right, so going forward, um, you know, what to look for out there. Um, like I said, main, the main thing should be keep an open mind, keep an open eye, because it can really look like anything. Um, but look for, for frightened people, you know, people that are, that seem to be scared for no reason, right? They don't trust. They don't necessarily want to put their trust in you or anyone else, right? Um, a lot of times these people are living in abject poverty, right? So if you see someone that works 40 hours a week on a farm, but yet doesn't seem to have a, a penny to spend, right? There might be something more going on in that situation. Um, you also want to look for a lack of control. A lot of times these people have every aspect of their lives controlled by someone else. You know, the reason why um, those four individuals that I talked about on the farm were eventually found is because the person who gave their checks on payday realized that every time payday is here, there's two older women with them, right? And they, we never see these older women really on any other day, but except when payday comes, they're always there right next to their side, right? So, you know, look for people that don't necessarily choose when they come and go to work or when they do things. And then again, a lack of access. This is key. When you know, when you notice someone who does not have access to the outside world, right? Because a victim's access to the outside world is danger to a trafficker. Mm -hmm. right? The more someone has access to the outside world, the more chance that that victim might be found and that that trafficker might be found, right? So this is why it's tough, right? Because if they don't have access to the outside world, how do we get access to them, right? And that's I mean, it's a question that I don't have the answer to, right? But it's something that we just need to look for, right? And then when we do look for it, we really need to always keep in mind that they're scared. We need to understand where they're coming from, which will hopefully allow them to open up to us and allow us to help, which is the goal at the end of the day. So, in conclusion, really, um, I just want to thank all of you for being out here today. Uh, this is a cause that is dear to me, um, and it's a cause that that has a long way to go. And it's awesome to see this many people out here uh, concerned and doing something about it. And I really just want to encourage you guys to keep doing what you're doing, um, to keep fighting, and remember that you know these people are human beings. They are the same as human beings. They may look a little bit different, but they're human beings, and they deserve. And that's as simple as it is. And it's up to us, really, that have been fortunate enough, you know, to to be in positions where we can help to actually help those people. So go forward. Remember what is out there. Remember what victims are going through, and do your best to stop it. And I really appreciate your attention and your time.